Okay, so once we have our preflop nailed down, the next thing we want to look at is our flop strategy. And uh, GTO Wizard, you can put up any flop you like um, for all the stack depths and positions that it has. So I generally just start with ASA2 because it's a very straightforward flop. It's fairly obvious, I think, to everybody that it's likely the preflop raiser is going to have an advantage on this flop. Yep. Uh, any ace is going to be a strong hand. They're going to have opened more ace x. They're going to have all the sets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we just enter the flop ASA2, as I've already done. Um, and then I usually start my investigation by just comparing the two ranges. Uh, mm -hmm. So if we go to post flop, uh, there's a lot of useful information here. Um, the most useful is the equity. Who has the most equity in this flop? This is who will win the most often with their entire range on every possible run out. So yep. on the left, we have the big blind. They have 37.3% equity, so they are going to win 37.3% of the time. And the button on the right-hand side is going to win the rest of the time. Yeah. 62.7% uh, uh, seems like a massive advantage. Yeah, yeah, it clearly is. And that's and that's going to uh, affect the strategy. When one player has such a big range advantage, particularly when they're in position, they're probably going to be betting 100% of the time and the other player is going to be checking 100% of the time. Yeah. Uh, the, the bottom half of this is super useful as well. GTO Wizard has a couple of ways of looking at this information. This is the <laughs> one that I personally find the most useful because it, it's the best visualization of how the ranges are stacking up against each other. They have four yeah. equity buckets, what they call best hands, which are hands with more than 70% equity. Good hands, hands that are 50 to 70 percent weak hands 30 to 50 percent equity and trash minus 30 uh, 30 percent or less so you can see that not only does um the button have equity advantage here but they have far more very strong hands 364 percent right. of their range is made up of very strong hands and only 10.3 percent of uh, the big blinds range um, when you hover over it it, 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 it shows you the hands that are considered to be in this bucket. Uh, you also have good hands. Good hands are 50 to 70. You know, that's a lot of middle pair um, so, so under pairs like seven sixes. They're all good, but not great on this board. Uh, and again, clear, clear advantage there for the button. They have mm. more good hands. They have roughly the same amount of weak hands, um, but far more trash in the big blinds range. So this is going to affect the strategy when one player has um, such a advantage, not just in overall equity, but just far more strong hands. This is another way of representing the same information. The green line is the button. Um, mm. the, other, the other graph is the big blind and over the entire range. So starting from the weakest hand in both ranges to say at the 50% point, the strongest hand is 4-3 of... The 50% point for, for the big blind is 4-3 of spades, which is a gut shot and a backdoor mm -hmm. flush draw. Um, button's halfway hand is king 10 suited, which is king high, which is going to be hit a lot of the time. Backdoor flush draw, backdoor straight draw. So you can see at this point in the range, there's a there's a fairly humongous advantage for um, the imposition player. And that advantage mm -hmm. continues the whole way over the flop, over, over mm -hmm. the entire range, even at the very top, tippy top. Uh, the tippy top of of um, the buttons range is aces, which is the nuts obviously yeah. right now. And the best possible hand the uh, the big blind can have is ace eight. Right. Uh, they have no sets. Uh, you can also drill down. It, you can divide it up into more equity buckets if you like. So you can have like 90 to 100, 80 to 90, 70 to 80, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Personally, I don't find that that useful. Uh, no, you beat me to it. I, I, I think the last thing you just put up was very simple, and that seems like something only a supercomputer would need to know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I don't think that's it. Uh, this, this is useful though. This is to, this yeah. tells you how often you have, for example, a set to pair, and you can, and this is kind of graphic as well. Like, okay, it's only a small part of the range, but the button does have sets. Uh, mm. Mine has zero percent. They both have some two pair but 
slightly more again for the button, but way more top fair pair for the button. Yeah. Uh, and then they have the other stuff as well. Uh, you can also look at draws, uh, how, how much draws they have. Obviously, there's there are no immediate uh, flush draws or straight draws on this. The best thing either player can have is a gut shot. And actually, this is the one area where the big blind has more of. They have more gut shots. Mm -hmm. um, uh, double backdoor hands. Our backdoor flush draws, sorry, um, are make up 25% of both players' range, and then they have a lot of no draw hands. But personally, I find this one the most useful uh, equity oh, button. Yeah. Kind of just tells you. And generally, you can you can predict from from these numbers or this graph how, how a situation is going to play. We know clear range advantage for uh, the button. So therefore, the big blind is always going to have to check. Anytime you're at a range disadvantage and you're out of you're out of position, you just have to check. That's a that's mm -hmm. a an immutable law of poker. If you start leading your your strong hands, you know if you're sitting there with ace eight suited or ace two suited, and you go, well, I want to lead. Yeah, okay, that's fine. You can lead that hand, but you become really easy to play against. Your opponent mm -hmm. can now go, well, okay, you've got a strong hand. If I can't beat your strong hand, I I, I fold, or you know maybe I bluff and pretend I have aces. Um, but the real problem comes when you check, because then when you're checking, you're you're basically telling your opponent you don't have a strong hand, and 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 you become a lot easier to play against. So when we go back to look at the strategy, you'll see every hand in the range just checks for the big blind. Yeah. And then once they check, what does the button do? The button never checks. They bet a hundred percent of the time. GTO Wizard uses an, a, a a number of different sizings, but on this board. You can ignore anything that's less five than five percent. So you know there's no there's no really big betting. Uh, there's some uh, just over half posh. There's this size is used a lot, one third pot, and this size is used a lot. Personally, I would just simplify the strategy here uh, to maybe bet a third pot or slightly less with yeah two percent of hands. There's no hand. That really wants to bet big a lot of the time, bigger. Um, so yeah, just simplify your strategy. It makes perfect sense that we just use this size. And then this is really kind of the first decision point in the hand, because if you think about it from a game theory perspective, because of the way the ranges are constructed, the big blind has to check irrespective of what they are and they have. So there's no information in their check. The button has to bet because they have mm. such a strong range. Um uh, so again, zero information. Now the question is, what does the uh, what does the big blind do in response? Now the way to think about these spots is think about what your strongest hands want to do. Right. Um, the strongest hands the uh, the big blind can have are two pairs: ace eight, ace two, and a two suited. Mm. Now. They mostly want to raise because they would like to get money into the pot. Even though they're they're quite strong, they are somewhat vulnerable. Like mm -hmm. if you have a hand, even if you have a hand as strong as ace eight, if your opponent has ace ten, uh, or you know, even if they have a hand as weak as uh, king two suited, they have they, they they have a decent amount of outs against you. So. You do actually want to raise now. You don't want to raise big because your hand isn't isn't too vulnerable. So the only raise size that's used is thirty three percent. But those hands do want to raise, and also our strongest ace x can raise. Like yeah, they're, they're they're pretty strong hands. They can get called by worse. So so we have a small value range, uh, which which is mostly functioning around the two pairs, and then the strongest top pairs that we have. And then once we've decided that we have a value range and what size it wants to bet. Um, you know, it's it's strong and not particularly vulnerable. Uh, so so we're going to use a small size. Then you decide what are what are the best bluffs to use. Mm. Uh, the bluffs always have certain characteristics. Characteristic number one: little or no showdown. Uh, they should be crap hands right now. Yeah. Uh, characteristic number two. Lots of turn cards that improve them in some way, um, and uh, and 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 the reason why we want those types of hands is if we if we choose those types of hands, 
we nothing really bad can happen when we check raise as a bluff. Let's say we choose a hand like six five of diamonds, which is used a lot as a bluff. Mm. If we check raise and the opponent folds, that's a great result. We just won mm. the pot with six high. They almost certainly folded a better hand than six high. Mm. On the other hand, if we used a hand like King Jack of Diamonds, uh, if we check raise and they fold, it's nice, but it's not such a good result because it'll almost certainly have been a worse hand than King Jack of Diamonds. So yeah. six five of diamonds makes a much better bluff raise than King Jack of Diamonds because King Jack of Diamonds actually has showdown. And most of the mm -hmm. hands that will fold to the raise will be hands that it's, it's ahead of. So getting the fold is, is very good when we have 6-5. What happens if they call? Um, it's certainly not the end of the world. We're going to get to see the turn card. There's a lot of turn cards we improve on. A 3 or a 4 gives us a gut shot. Mm -hmm. A 5 or a 6 gives us a pair, which you know will pull ahead of uh, some of the range. And then a diamond gives us a flush draw. We can so on any card that improves us, we can we can consider betting again as a bluff mm. if it's if it's just a straight draw or a flush draw. Um if we don't improve, we can just give up. Uh and we haven't invested too much money in the pot. We've aborted the mission. This also keeps our frequencies correct. To play good balanced poker, you have to have hands that play aggressively on the street, but will shut down on the next street. Mm. And they also have to fall into in, in, in into the category of being just a bluff that you're giving up on or something with marginal showdown that you're now exerting pot control with. If you think about yeah. us, what, what happens uh, with when we check raise six, five suited, if we get a two, a three a, or, a, or a nine, we pick up a gut shot. Yeah. That's a good hand to bluff again. Uh, we can bet the turn. Sometimes we hit the river and we can win a really big pot. Sometimes we miss the river, but we have six high and we can consider bluffing if it, if it was a good run out for us overall. So it's giving us a good good flexibility. We have we have a hand that can be bet on the next street and can actually be bet for value on the river some of the time. Hmm. If, we, if we get a seven, we, we, we improve to a very strong draw on the turn. We're open-ended now. Um, so, uh, so, you know, maybe we can play that more cautiously and just try and realize our equity. Uh, we can check it, but we're not folding when they when they bet. Uh, if we hit a five or a six, we hit a pair, so maybe we can check call that as well. Mm. Um, and if we hit a flush draw card, you know we can go either way. We can bet again either as a bluff, or maybe we can check call if we if we think they're not going to get bet big. So there's lots of turn cards where we have lots of uh, options. There are some turn cards we'll just give up on if we get you know the king of, the king of spades, which doesn't help us in any way. Uh, we can just check and give up. So these types of hands just give you great flexibility and playability over later streets. Um, so that's why when they call our bet on the on the on the flop, that's not a bad outcome either. Whereas if we bet the king jack suited and they call us, it's not such a great option because we probably just found out that they have a better hand than us. Yeah, and then we the last thing we'd want to do is then hit our king or jack as well, I guess, right? Really yeah, simple. this is the thing. If we check call king jack. And a king or a jack comes on the turn, we can feel fairly good about our king or a jack. We pull ahead a lot of the a lot of the range. Unless they have an ace, we're probably ahead now. Um, but if we check raise king jack and they call, uh, even if we hit our king or jack, first of all, they're going to have the ace far more often. Um, so so we're not so so we're not going to be ahead of much of the range. So by by check raising, we've actually destroyed our pair outs in a sense that if we yeah. hit our pair on the turn, we're not going to feel good. But by check calling, we preserve our pair outs. Um, we're going to feel a lot better about them. Um, so when we check race six five suited, it's a great result if they fold. It's fine if they call. What what about if they raise? Well, obviously that's the least desirable of the three possibilities. But you know, not the end of the world. We're folding six high. Uh, yeah. It's we have a very easy decision. On the other hand, if we check race king jack suited and 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 we get raised again, it's going to feel a lot worse to have to fold that hand. Mm -hmm. um, so solvers will use these low no showdown double backdoor hands that they're, that's the, the, their favorite bluffs it's no surprise that most of the bluffs are coming from this region 7-5 suited 6-5 suited 5-4 suited 5-3 suited those hands the stronger the draw is 
like 4-3 suited, for example, with a backdoor flush draw is not actually being used as a bluff all that often because it's strong enough to call. Yeah. It just wants to realize equity. And the other thing is you need to have both types of hands in both buckets. Like if you always check raise your low card hands that can hit straights, then when you check call and a low card comes, you can't have a straight. Um, mm -hmm. And the best hands to play passively are actually the stronger ones, the stronger draws, uh, the 4-3 suited, which is an immediate gut shot. Um, so that's where, that's where the bluffs are coming from. And, and then you just fold everything else. Um, so that's the way you should be thinking about flops in general. Now, let's just look at what happens before we, we, we wrap this video up. What happens if we do raise? We're raising this range here. It's a pretty strong hand, so a, a, a very strong hand or a very weak hand. So if we do raise, how does the button respond? And the answer is the button does very little raising. Mm. Uh, they mostly just call because most of their hands are ahead of the bluffs, but behind the uh, behind the value. Yeah. Um, really, it has to be a very strong ace to feel very good about itself. Um, and then if you have a super strong hand like eights or twos or aces, you don't want to raise because you want to keep the bluffs in. So essentially, you're you're up against a polarized range here now. If we go back and look at the ranges, uh, they the ranges have been changed by what's happened on the flop. When the flop came down, we looked at this already. Much stronger range for the big blind. But after it goes, bet raise, and it's back on the button. Look how it's flipped around. Mm. Now, most of the big blinds range is either a very strong hand or a very weak hand. And there's not much in between. The opposite is true for the uh, the big blind. Most of their hands are are crammed into this these two buckets, the middle buckets. Mm. So uh, this is uh, this is almost not quite because it, it's a slight oversimplification just to say that this is polar range against condensed range because the the uh, the the big the button does have some very strong hands still. And you know the sets, for example, and does have some trash, but most of their range is in the middle. And by and the big blind does have some medium strength hands here, but again, most of their range is either very strong or very weak. So it is a, it, it's it's close to a polar versus condensed range. And anytime you have polar versus condensed range, the player with the polar range would be the one doing the betting. And the player with the condensed range would mostly be just calling. Yeah. Uh, any questions? Um, no, I mean, if you just briefly go back to the um, uh, the, the big the, the last node. Uh, the, the the one thing that I um, um, I know I've needed to improve in my own game is that the, the, there is always a check raising range, which some people never have a check raising range. Yeah. Um, and also, I've just always found this part of the game tree to be very easy to visualize. Um, you know, there's there's always like um, the value tends to be off, off in one corner of the grid, and the bluffs tend to be in a another clearly defined corner of the grid, and then the folds tend to be um, clustered around the same types of hands. It's 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 uh, I'm someone who's always struggled struggled looking at ranges personally, but this is always one aspect of solver work where I actually it's very easy for me to visualize a lot of hands in the range. Mm. That, yeah, that's a that's a very good observation, and 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 you're right. That generally is the shape. It's like your top hand, your your best hands, and then your bluffs are typically coming a lot of the time in this region, and then your pairs are kind of calling, and then everything else is is kind of the blue region that's folding. It's it, it's also worth noting that you can't check raise at least in theory all of your really strong hands because then your check call range is too weak. Yeah, uh, you need to be able to continue. So, you, so, so the solver is mixing. It's mostly check raising ace eight. Um, it's it's actually mostly check calling ace deuce. It's always check raising eight deuce. That those are the three strongest hands it has in its range, um, and that's just its way of mixing basically. Uh, yeah. If you're playing against real life opponents who are not going to pounce on your on your check call range, uh, realizing that you always check raise, then you probably just ha should just always check raise when you have a very strong hand. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, even 
you don't have to be a very sophisticated player to pick up that if somebody is always check raising when they have a strong hand mm. um and 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 take advantage of that then when they just check call um and yeah so i picked this board because it's obviously such a straightforward board it's very clear who has range advantage it's not a dynamic board in any way whoever has the best hand right now is likely to have the best hand on the turn, but nevertheless, there is check raising, and you t and you touched on a probably one of the most common leaks I see in recreational players. They don't check raise enough on these boards. They just yeah. think, well, you know, if I have a strong ace, I want him to keep bluffing. Uh, if I have two pair, I want him to keep bluffing. But out of position, you you have to try and get money into the pot, and by check raising some strong hands, you get to you get to do some bluffing as well. Um, mm. and uh, so you know there's two reasons for it you make more money with your strong hands and you sometimes win pots you shouldn't when you have yeah. a weak hand but what but it's it's super important to get in this idea of the types of hands that should be bluffs um because that adds to your profitability picking the right types of hands you're sacrificing very little when you when you get raised again because you had no showdown equity very little equity overall but when you get called once in a blue moon, you'll turn into a very strong hand by the river and win a huge pot mm. when they actually have something. Um, but it also gives you potential bluffs on, on later streets. Whereas if you start check raising the wrong types of hands, like jack six off for some reason, um, it's like, well, okay, yeah, only one good thing can happen. They can fold. If they yeah. call or raise, uh, those are two bad outcomes. And if they call, like, what turn card are you going to feel good about? Exactly, yeah. To, so to summarize, when you're studying post slot, you should have a fairly standard approach to it. Um, look at the preflop ranges first. Understand the preflop ranges, and you know what type what type of hands are missing from both ranges. Typically, you know the opener is going to have all the strongest hands down to whatever the weakest hand that they're going to open, and the the, the defender will be missing stuff at the top which they would have three bet and at the bottom which would they, they would have just folded so it's important to understand uh the pre-flop ranges then on the on, on a specific flop look at the equities and who has range advantage you know for example on on a flop like ASA2 well obviously the pre-flop racer is going to have the range advantage because the ace favors them whereas on a low card board uh, that, that that could be different Pay particular attention to the strong and weak hand buckets because when you have a lot of strong hands, uh, you, you 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 have not an advantage, and that that that's going to affect the strategy. Similarly, if you have a lot of weak hands or your opponent has a lot of weak hands, that's going to affect the strategy primarily in terms of sizing. If you're playing against an opponent and most of their hands are weak hands and you use a big size, guess what? You just made their life very easy. They can just fold all their their weak hands. Um. So it's important to look at how many weak hands uh, your opponents have. And if that's their biggest bucket, then that will affect your strategy. Um, and then look at how the solver picks value in bluffs. The, the, the criteria for value is when called, we have to be good more than half the time. Um, so think about, okay, what's the weakest hand I could, I, I could value bet that that would be true for. Um, and, and then once you've once you know how much value you have, you know how many bluffs roughly you can choose. And in a situation where you've lots of value, you get to do lots of bluffing. In a situation where you have very little value, you very little bluffing. And then how do you how does the solver actually pick the bluffs? How does it decide what the bluffs are? There, there there's a couple of universal principles um, which we've covered in um, in this video. And then the final point is what bet size makes sense on on, on this type of flop and and why.